What was the point of hearing from citizens about what they wanted, what they needed, and what they expected in terms of a level playing field that supported the values of fairness and accessibility? Honourable Speaker, I'm pleased to move that the Local Elections Campaign Financing Expenses Amendment Act 2016 be read for a second time. British Columbians and election participants express their support for expense limits for local government elections. This legislation paves the way to implement expense limits for the next local government elections in British Columbia in 2018. So, when the Special Committee on Local Elections Expense Limits was first struck back in October 2014, the committee was tasked with the following. So in phase one, the committee was asked to examine, inquire into, and make recommendations to the Legislative Assembly. Bill 17 provides, based on the consultation, the legislation will create a framework for expense limits. Honorable Speaker, this committee heard from a range of speakers during phase one of our work. We received lots of online feedback and we consulted with numerous stakeholders. There were 916 uh, presentations, Mr. Speaker. Everyone agreed that we needed to address runaway spending in local elections. In total, the task force received over 10,000 written submissions. The feedback was key to identifying the success and gaps in the local election process. It indicated the complexity of the issues involved and the strong and diverse opinions that arose from this discussion. So when there's all the talk about all of the consultation that went on, you have to understand consultation means something if people are heard. And if it's reflected, uh, their comments are reflected in the final result. And when you take a big piece of the conversation and don't allow it to occur, mm because you remove it from the mandate of the committee that was hearing from people, then you create a problem. And that's exactly what's happened here around this piece of legislation. When the government refused to permit the committee to look at the impact political donations have on our democratic process, the committee lost an opportunity to correct a weakness in our electoral system. It is unfortunate. Bill 17 would have been stronger had it been complete. Thank you. Mr. Speaker, this is a, the, the legislative committee did actually come to consensus on uh, their recommendations, uh, with one exception, uh, Mr. Speaker, and it, and it is a notable one and one mentioned uh, by the vice chair, the member from Coquitlam, around the issue of, of donations. And uh, the, uh, on our side of the committee, if that's the right way to put it, uh, did uh, propose a motion where we try to, uh, to get um, government to change the terms of reference of the committee to include donations. Unfortunately, that was the one issue where the committee uh, uh, couldn't agree, and uh, the, the government members uh, voted down uh, our motion to try and get the terms of reference changed so that we could look at the donation side of the equation, uh, Mr. Speaker. The special committee's mandate was intentionally de defined to not allow consideration of contribution limits. Why would that be? Again, because we see liberals think that this will benefit them and it will enhance their electoral chances. There's no question that there was broad public support for spending limits. Uh, there was also, as I said uh, earlier, Mr. Speaker, there was also very broad public support for uh, uh, limitations on the donation side. Mm -hmm. 
yes, uh, essentially, the, uh, the notion of putting in place uh, expense limits is a good thing. It's something that this side has spoken to uh, on numerous occasions and something that we believe is necessary to be put in place um, at the local level. It is uh, an exercise at the federal level, at the provincial level, and it certainly should be put in place at the local level. But, Honorable Speaker, the challenge with Bill 17 is it truly is a half a loaf um, if, you, uh, uh, if you really want to look at it. Because while it speaks to the expense side, it does not speak to contributions uh, in any way, shape, or form. Setting limits on the amount that individuals can donate is not a new idea. We, uh, we have it federally. It works. It's not perfect, but it brings some sense among citizens that elections aren't susceptible to purchase uh, by the higher, highest bidder. We don't see that, Honorable Speaker, uh, in this bill. We don't see this in uh, a bill that follows consultations that was, were supposed to modernize uh, municipal elections and local government. And in fact, one uh, comment even suggests that by only dealing with half the problem, you might have made the situation, you might have made the situation a bit, a bit worse. Mr. Speaker, the expense limits period for candidates and elector organizations will be altered from the initial proposal for a January 1st date to 28 days prior to the close of election day, which is the th third Saturday of October. This creates alignment between provincial and local government expense limit period. The minister indicated that the, um, uh, the, the, uh, the legislation uh, that's being brought forward in the form of Bill 17 is consistent with the principle of fairness. And, and Mr. Speaker, uh, clearly it's not uh, for two reasons, because it didn't deal with donations and because it didn't deal with the pre-election period. So I, I strongly disagree with the minister uh, on this point. Um, it is not addressed completely or as fulsomely as it should have that principle of fairness, which is really the fundamental principle we're trying to achieve here with this legislation. The, the minister also indicated that the, um, the decision to remove the pre-election cap from the legislation that was unanimously agreed to by the committee uh, is consistent with provincial legislation, <laughs> which of course, Mr. Speaker, is technically true. And the only reason, though, that it is consistent with provincial legislation is because last year, the pre-election spending cap uh, in, in provincial elections was eliminated by Bill 20. That's why it's consistent. UBCM also suggested uh, that it would be important to have local election uh, rules uh, consistent with provincial rules, and uh, they did uh, single out the pre-election uh, spending period. Uh, our, our recommendation to include that, the UBCM did point out that that was inconsistent with provincial legislation, but, Mr. Speaker, we would argue uh, on this side of the House, the only reason it's inconsistent is because government has removed a long-standing provision uh, for limitations on spending uh, during the, the pre-election period. Even there, there's a flaw, Honorable Speaker. We have the, the expense limits uh, in place for the 28 days prior to the close of Election Day, but nothing prior to that. Uh, which, which in fact mirrors the changes that uh, the government has made to uh, provincial election uh, expenses. We have limits for a 28-day period, and we have the Wild West for any period of time prior to that. And when you couple that with the other glaring flaw in this bill, which is uh, no limits on uh, contributions as well as uh, no uh, limit on who can con contribute, uh, I'm not sure this bill is going to actually achieve the desired result. So, Honorable Speaker, I, I want to point out another concern that I have around this piece of legislation that we have before us, Bill 17. Now, the Special Committee on Local Elections 
expense limits, unanimously endorsed the recommendation that the campaign period would start on January 1st of the election year so that all expenses captured during those months would be subject to the expense limit. In fact, when the Legislative Assembly adopted the Local Elections Campaign Financing Act, also known as LECFA, in May 2014, it included the notion that, and I quote, the campaign period is the start of the calendar year during which a general local election is held until the end of the election proceedings period. So back in 2014, there was clear recognition by the ministry, the ministry staff, the stakeholders, and all the MLAs of this house that there needs to be some period of time prior to the formal campaign period of 28 days by which we limit some spending. A campaign spending occurs not just during the writ period, but leading up to the writ period. And if you don't deal with those two fundamental issues, Mr. Speaker, you've left a, a rather large uh, uh, hole in the barn door uh, through which uh, influence can get out. I think I'm getting a little carried away with my metaphors. But if you don't deal with those two issues, you're not completely dealing with uh, the issue of election fairness. Through consultation, Bill 17 contains the following changes. The expense limits period for candidates, both independent and endorsed, will be 28 days prior to election day. On page 33 of this document, under the elections proceedings period, Honourable Speaker, it states this. The committee received notice from the government late in the process of its work of a proposed change to the local elections campaign period from 46 days to 28 days. Committee members expressed concern that the 2014 expenditure data included all spending from January the 1st until Election Day, and therefore the committee's recommendations were based on the analysis of a longer campaign period. Our one concern is that candidates may make purchases of election materials, such as flyers or advertising materials, and use these materials prior to a 28-day period, and not have this captured as an expense. Committee members agreed that in order for expense limits to be effective, they must apply to all campaign spending, Honourable Speaker. They concluded that the local expense limits recommended by the Committee for Electoral Organizations and Candidates should apply from January the 1st of the election year to Election Day. In formulating its recommendations on expense limits, the Special Committee undertook public and stakeholder consultation. Public hearings were held in Surrey, Kamloops, Victoria, and Vancouver. The committee heard evidence from individuals, candidates, elector organizations, and other stakeholders. So, Honourable Speaker, I heard from members off opposite that they consulted. Indeed, they did. But coming back to my first point, consultation is not just sitting and listening. It's about reacting to what you heard in a manner that's consistent to what you heard and that puts all to together the various issues that are raised before you. This is a very specific recommendation from a committee, Honourable Speaker, very specific, yet it is ignored. And I just do not understand why it is ignored. Why would government ignore this? Why would it ignore its own committee that it has majority vote on? Why would it do that? I don't know. Um, in fact, we came to unanimous agreement that it was important to try and limit uh, uh, spending, uh, campaign spending, uh, in that pre-election period as well as uh, during the, the, the so-called uh, RIP period. Um, unfortunately, Mr. Speaker, that uh, recommendation uh, has been dropped from this legislation and it's a significant significant omission I think on the side of the house we would we would agree that the legislation is a is a step forward but it, it doesn't finish the job and unless you deal with uh, with donations and pre-election um, campaign spending you haven't you haven't really done the job at the federal level you do have limits uh, strict limits on both the spending and the donation side. And Mr. Speaker, until just last year, we had uh, limits uh, provincially 
on spend, and, and by the way, federally, those limits apply both pre-election and during the, during the writ period. Uh, and, but provincially, um, until just last year, we also had uh, strict limits on spending both during the writ period and, and pre-campaign. And so when it came to that issue of consistency and whether or not uh, it, uh, the committee should consider pre-election limitation, spending limitations for local government, one of the things we looked at was, well, what are the provincial rules, what are the federal rules? Despite the fact that the province had just eliminated the spending cap at the provincial level pre-election, this was quite interesting. And I, I, was, um, I was actually heartened by the fact that the, the committee members from the government side agreed, despite the fact that the province had just eliminated those pre-election spending caps provincially, uh, when you talked it through, and given our experience as locally elected officials formally, when we talked it through, we agreed. It was very important to control spending, not just during the, not just during the writ period. Unfortunately, uh, Mr. Speaker, government has not, not agreed with that. don't vote. Honorable Speaker, corporations don't vote. People vote. It is the people who vote to put people into this legislature, who put people into local governments, who put people into local school boards, who put people in auto in the federal government. Yet, Honorable Speaker, we're being asked here once again to approve a bill that allows unions and corporations to determine who is in local government. Now, I know that the official opposition supports the notion of not allowing union and corporate donations, both provincially and in local government elections. But we continue to allow this to happen. And what's so troubling about this is you're len len left with the question of whose interests are being represented. It creates for people the belief that things are unfair and that they are in, uh, intrinsically unfair uh, and that the unfairness is in fact structured into the system. So, Honourable Speaker, that's one of the reasons that on this side we have consistently said that it's time to end that and that the best way to do that is to adopt the model that has been adopted by the federal government and to end corporate and union donations and to say that individuals will be the only people who will be allowed to make a contribution and that there will be limits on how much those contributions are. The, the area that was needed to be fixed isn't being fixed here. You know, many other jurisdictions that other speakers before me have mentioned, they have limits on union, corporations, contributions. They have limits on individual contributions. Not only have we heard in this place, but we've heard from many and many local elected representatives that they also believe that a limit on contributions and a limit or an elimination of union and corporate donations <coughs> makes sense. And they are supportive of that. And they are people who are beneficiaries of union and corporate donations saying, it's not good for our democracy, and we should bring it to an end. But this legislation, Bill 17, ignored them. 
as you know, Honorable Speaker, uh, many people have called for an end to union and corporate donations, provincially as well as municipally. We, we see that they've been uh, largely eliminated uh, in the federal sphere. Uh, it hasn't brought democracy crashing to its knees. It hasn't stopped people from being heard. What it has done is, uh, is go a long way toward taking big money out of uh, federal politics. Uh, we on this side of the House believe the same thing should happen in provincial elections, and certainly we think they should happen in municipal elections, and we're joined in that view uh, by uh, representatives and many people in Vancouver, the, uh, the area I represent in this legislature. And of course, uh, Vancouver is prohibited from making those changes on their own because uh, the government, the provincial government, won't allow Vancouver to make such a change. And apparently now it won't allow any municipality to make such a change. And Honorable Speaker, given uh, the number of submissions that were made that called for this, it's beyond me why deaf ears returned to those entreaties. So I guess that it makes a little bit of sense to me that the government might be reluctant to talk about eliminating union and corporate donations at the local level. They might feel a little bit hypocritical. The hypocrisy might be a bit much for them uh, to say we're going to limit the contributions at the local level when we put no limits on ourselves. I understand the hypocrisy of that, and, and maybe that's what the government was thinking when it chose not to, uh, to put contribution limits in place. Ontario, Quebec, Alberta, and Manitoba have contribution limits. Uh, Quebec and Manitoba, as well as the federal government, uh, ban contributions from corporations and trade unions. Why aren't we doing this here? The perception is there that that, that means something, that that gets a favor. Um, and that is not something that we want to have uh, in our system of, of, of governance. Hence, on this side of the House, Honorable Speaker, we have said uh, that we would like to ban union and corporate, corporate donations at the provincial level. The failure to impose contribution limits or to ban corporate and union donations and the permitting of uncontrolled expenditures prior to the writ period itself are illustrative of one thing and one thing only, a government which has continuing interest in manipulating the political process to its own ends, a government that has little interest in helping to restore the faith of the people in the democratic process. And that is my concern around this bill, that in fact that is one of the things we may well do, as opposed to doing other things that would achieve the same effect, and I'm sure that this is the aim of the government, which is to enhance trust in the public process, enhance trust in the electoral process, and enhance trust in those people who put their names forward because you know who's supporting them, how much they're being supported with, what their campaigns cost, and whether they're going to be or likely to be responsive to the groups or individuals that support them. If you have a system banning corporate union donations, Honourable Speaker, it's a little simpler. It's about the individuals. How much influence do they, did they expect when they made a significant campaign donation? based on recommendations of a special committee on local election expense limits convened by this Legislative Assembly in the fall of 2014. The committee made a number of recommendations to the Legislative Assembly in two phases. In phase one, the committee recommended principles of fairness, neutrality, transparency, accountability for establishing expense limits for participants in British Columbia's local government elections. The legislation honors those principles. In phase two, the committee recommended expense limit amounts for candidates and third party advertisers. Now, Honourable Speaker, as we all know, consultation is a very important component of building social license for any bill. But consultation, Honourable Speaker, is more than listening, it's about reacting to that which you've been told in a way that reflects what you've been told. 
While much of this bill has done that, there are some glaring omissions, which I'll come to shortly. The omissions with respect to the continued allowance of corporate and union donors, as well as the fact that there are no caps on the magnitude of individual donations, and the reduction of the campaign period to 28 days, thereby allowing essentially free-for-all spending by any person, any corporation, or any union for anyone prior to the campaign period. Consultation has played an important role in forming the local elections reform process. Consultation played a key role in all major steps in the process, including in 2010, Local Government Elections Task Force, in 2013, Phase 1 Legislation for Local Elections Reform, the White Paper. Also in 2013, Phase 2 Expense Limits for Local Elections Reform Discussion Paper. And in 2015, the 2015 Special Committee on Local Elections Expense Limits. In addition, there have been many meetings and briefings with key stakeholder organizations, such as the Union of BC Municipalities, Local Government Area Associations, and Local Government Management Association the BC School Trustees Association, electoral organizations, as well as third-party advertisers. Public hearings were held in Surrey, Kamloops, Vancouver, and Victoria. The committee heard evidence from individuals, candidates, electoral organizations, and other stakeholders. But in all that consultation, Honourable Speaker, um, we know that the government, the government side, made a conscious decision to exclude the contributions discussion. Uh, the special committee, uh, in their report uh, uh, in June of 2015, uh, made the following statement, <clears throat> and it's because of decisions the government made about the mandate of that committee. So what the committee said is, many participants in the public consultation process raised other issues outside the mandate of this committee, including contribution limits and potential conflicts of interest some advocating a ban on corporate and union donations. So, Honourable Speaker, when the previous uh, uh, member uh, was talking about the levels and the breadth of consultation, um, consultation is a good thing, but it really becomes effective if you actually allow those voices to be heard in the report. <clears throat> but when the government shuts the mandate, narrows the mandate, and doesn't allow contribution discussions and other matters to be discussed, all of a sudden you have the half a loaf you have a report that's incomplete, and you have a piece of legislation that doesn't deal with all of the critical issues around how money plays a role in local elections. The Local Elections Campaign Financing Act is being amended to allow for implementation of expense limits as recommended by the Joint BC-UBCM Local Government Elections Task Force. Honorable oh, Speaker, we were we were commissioned to go out into um, various communities around British Columbia and hear what people wanted for their local elections. So I believe that this government um, did not want, did not want us to talk about uh, contribution limits. Because uh, I do think that that's part of fairness and certainly we heard that a lot in committee. Bill 17 was given first reading during the fall 2015 legislative session. This is because our government wanted to ensure that our province's voters and candidates had a final opportunity to review specific proposals regarding expense limits. It was envisioned by the task force that if expense limits were put into place, there would be no, ne no need to limit contributions. Again, we've taken a measured approach. We haven't taken an ax to this process. We've made sure, we've consulted. Everyone has been engaged. Honourable Speaker, the current Justice Minister, when she was a Vancouver City Council, uh, supported the ban, supported the uh, ban on, uh, on such donations, and yet here uh, she simply votes against amendments that would have helped level the playing field and increase engagement. Mr. Speaker, the Special Committee on Local Election Expense Limits and my ministry undertook considerable public and stakeholder consultation. We heard abundant input from individuals, candidates, elector organizations, and other stakeholders. 
And as this House knows, Mr. Speaker, this has been an issue that has been discussed. There have been various task forces in the past. And I believe, Mr. Speaker, that the implementation of expense limits will complete our commitment to the modernization of local government elections based on recommendations of the Joint BC Union of BC or British Columbia Municipalities Local Government Elections Task Force that was formed a number of years ago. We heard during phase one of the committee's work that it wasn't just spending limits that were creating problems with runaway spending, but contributions, Honourable Speaker, the other side of the election financing equation was also creating problems. In the case of elections for local government in British Columbia, we are now entering the final stages of a process that was started a number of years ago with the creation of the Local Government Elections Task Force, a joint task force between UBCM and government. With the passage of this legislation, we will have a complete new suite of democratic reforms that replaces those of more than 20 years ago. And yet, despite recognizing the singularity of the phenomenon that is the millions and millions and millions of dollars spent in Vancouver elections, the other side of the House has presented us with a bill that is not responsive in the least to the concerns that have been brought to this House by the City of Vancouver Council. And I will note that those concerns were brought to this House by the City of Vancouver Council, including the Council on which the Attorney General sat as a City Councillor. And she personally voted for a motion that asked this House to limit campaign contributions. And yet, as Attorney General in Cabinet, she and her colleagues, who all recognize that this is happening in Vancouver, present us a bill that doesn't limit campaign donations, doesn't ban union or corporate donations, doesn't require donations to be disclosed outside election years, doesn't uh, limit spending outside the 28-day election period, I've always believed, and it was in the case as um, then, as it is now, that elections aren't decided by the amount of, amount of money spent by a candidate, but, but they're decided by the message the candidate puts forth and the candidate's commitment to the citizens he or she will represent in the future. And as I remarked earlier, a person's financial situation should never be an implement or an impediment, I apologize, um, to seeking public office. And there is a belief in Vancouver that government is in the pocket of developers, the real estate industry, uh, people who profit from the status quo of unaffordable housing in the city of Vancouver. And what feeds that belief, Honourable Speaker? Huge campaign donations from individuals who are involved in this industry. It's resulting in a loss of confidence in government. That's why they want us to help restore confidence in local government by banning union and corporate donations, putting limit on, limits on donations, putting limits on the full year spending, not just the 28 days before the election, and requiring disclosure all the time, not just in an election year. And yet this bill does none of those things. It's been a long road indeed, Honourable Speaker, but well worth it because in the end, all British Columbians will benefit from a strong and more vibrant democratic system. Because the committee heard time and time again, we heard it from candidates, we heard it from elector organizations, we heard it from citizens. They all actually, I have to tell you, Honorable Speaker, they assumed we were considering contribution limits. Over and over again, people kept talking about contribution limits and, and expense limits. They were doing both. They were using them interchangeably because they were we were talking about fairness. And I hated telling our presenters that we were given strict instructions to only consider spending limits. And so many were shocked. Like, what? Only expense limits? Why not contribution limits? The Local Elections Campaign Financing Act is being amended to allow for implementation of expense limits as recommended by the Joint BC-UBCM Local Government Elections Task Force. I, I think, Honourable Speaker, the government side has to answer for why they are not addressing this issue, for why they are not listening to the voices of British Columbians and people who vote in municipal elections local government elections and, and doing something about uh, what many people now see as uh, a simply unacceptable process, whether it's uh, the lack of limits on contributions for individuals, whether it's the lack of limits 
on expenditure, except in a very narrow time band running up to the election, uh, or whether it is the continued influence of corporations and unions. Mr. Speaker, consultation has played an important role in forming the local elections reform process and played a key role in all the major steps of the process, including 2010 Local Government Elections Task Force, the 2013 Phase 1 Legislation for Local Elections Reform White Paper, the 2013 Phase 2 Expense Limits for Local Elections Reform Discussion Paper, the 2015 Special Committee on Local Elections Expense Limits, and Bill 43 Consultation. In addition, there have been many meetings and briefings with key stakeholders, organizations such as the Union of BC Municipalities, local government area associations, the local government management association, the BC School Trustees Association, elector organizations, and third party advertisers. Why is it that this government actually take one step forward, but they take two steps backward? They did that with provincial uh, electoral changes and spending. When they open up the period up to the, the writ drop day, it's open up now. It's all open. You can spend as much as you want. It used to be a limit. 60 days, I believe it was, 60 days immediately prior to the writ drop, there was a limit. We have contribution limits for federal campaigns, but this government doesn't seem to see fit to consider a contribution limit for either provincial or local elections. The election process in this province, the very root of democracy, has become hostage to money. We have all seen it. Everyone in this House knows it. The people know it. Limiting the money spent on a campaign is a good start. But when a single donor or company could underwrite a campaign, when pre-writ spending is unlimited, when disclosure is not even required pre-writ, we have a problem. Democracy has a problem. When a city like Vancouver asks for a ban on corporate un and union donations, when uh, many individuals come forward and uh, speak to uh, a committee and call for such a ban, why would the government ignore this? Why would action not be taken? Whose interests are uh, being represented with the decision not to move forward on either campaign contribution limits, on expense limits prior to a 28-day period, or on a banning of corporate and union donations. This province is out of step with the people and with the times. The expense limits established in Bill 17 are good, and I support the committee's work in that regard. But this bill should also be about setting contribution limits, Mr. Speaker, and restricting donations to individual voters, not organizations. This legislation does not ensure that somebody is elected by the people. This legislation assures, Honourable Speaker, that people can continue, uh, corporations could continue to give massive donations to fund political parties municipally, to fund political individuals municipally. And Honourable Speaker, I wanted this legislation to say no more. We follow Canada's lead. We ban corporate and union donations. We ensure that it's one person, one vote, one person, one donation, but not one person, one million dollar donation, Honourable Speaker. This legislation does not stop that from happening. We need to have addressed uh, contribution limits. We need to have addressed certainly the campaign uh, period because we have, I think, that to me was the most surprising piece in this legislation, that when the, the committee provided a unanimous recommendation and then it got changed, and I understand, I've, I've actually heard a little bit about why it got changed, I don't agree with the, uh, the rationale, because I think what will happen, Honourable Speaker, is those who have more to spend will spend more, they'll do it outside the rules, and that, Honourable Speaker, is a terrible loophole that actually 
con continues to promote uh, disdain and disgust among the electorate, and that's not good for democracy. That's not good for anyone, Honourable Speaker. Thank you. So this bill should have brought in a ban on corporate and union donations, full stop, for municipal campaigns. We should have that ban provincially as well. It should have ensured that we actually had pre-election spending rules. And I think, to a large extent, the public understands that there are limits, particularly at the federal level. And they sense that there are rules, and they are pleased that there are rules, and they know that um, those rules kind of govern and make the system fair. Honourable Speaker, and I, the reason I, I stand up is I do think that we cannot underestimate the need for people to have rules and to have confidence in our political system. And in fact, I would say, as we watch down in the States, as people become more alienated, they become angrier and angrier because they have, feel they are losing power over their own circumstances and that the politicians are not listening to their voices, but they're more interested in how big money um, plays out in the, in the play. It is the concept that organizations or businesses have some undue influence in the process that troubles people. And that is where this bill is entirely deficient, just indeed as the, our own Provincial Elections Act is deficient. In an era where the tr mistrust of politicians is so strong, so strong in what historically was regarded as the leading democracy, and I say this with great respect and conscious of the fact we might be addressing him as President Trump within a year, where a man like Donald Trump appears to be headed to becoming the nominee for the presidency of the United States for the Republican Party tells you how bad things have become when it comes to trusting politicians. I think a figure I saw in a magazine article the other day said that we've gone from like a 75% trust rate in government in the United States 30, 40 years ago to something like 15%. Jillian Skeet of Vancouver presented to the committee on April 9th as well. And this is what she had to say. The truth is that no one in our society, especially not those in business, gives money without expecting something in return. And both sides know this. Our political parties and our politicians are being bought by the highest bidders. If an election were held tomorrow and you told these same donors that the money would go into a centralized pot and would be shared fairly, perhaps according to votes, as it is done federally. I'm sure that many, if not all, of these donors would disappear. To restore democracy, we must bring in similar rules to those that now exist at the federal level. The damage that has been done to our democracy and to our city is irreparable in too many cases. It's truly tragic. And so it fails the test in terms of building trust in politics. It fails the test in terms of ensuring that it's people power, not corporate big money power. Now, I know, Honourable Speaker, down in the United States, some judges decided that corporations were people and that if you were to restrict their freedom of speech, so to speak, by giving millions or hundreds of millions of dollars to politicians, that somehow stopped them from having the freedom to speak. Well, Honourable Speaker, I go back to a different style of thinking, I suppose, which is to say that corporations aren't people. Simply put, they're not. And now I know some law treats them that way, but I don't think we should. And this, Honourable Speaker, this legislation seems to continue to back up this government's belief that we should treat corporations as people, and in fact, extra special people, because they can donate extra special amounts of money, at least compared to the average citizen. But if citizens are jaded, if citizens are frustrated, if citizens are disgusted by big money, 
And they're turned off the democratic process because they believe that money and big contributions are inappropriately influencing the outcome of elections. Then we as legislators are not doing our job. If British Columbians have lost faith in the democratic process, then we, the members of this House, have to take responsibility for that. We have um, a federal election or a federal electoral regime that limits contributions and limits expenses. And then it takes that extra leap of limiting corporations and limiting unions. So what happens in federally is individuals have to support and make donations um, on their own behalf to a political party. I think we're taking a great step uh, in this uh, uh, legislation, and so, Mr. Speaker, I will be supporting the legislation that is before us for local governments. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, but I'm reminded, Honourable Speaker, of something somebody said about Mackenzie King, that, you know, why do a thing by halves when you can do it by quarters? So we have a government that no longer represents the people. We have a government that puts its corporate friends first and thinks about the people second whether that be resident hunters, as I look at the minister over there, whether it be the resident people in Shawnigan Lake, as I look at the minister over there. Regardless of the issue, this is a government that's putting vested corporate interests first, people second. And what it's saying through this missed opportunity to our local elections, to school board elections, is that we are encouraging you to do the same. But, Honourable Speaker, is, would there be any harm what would be the harm in banning corporate union donations? What would be the harm um, in setting limits on contributions and even not worrying about expenses? And so if you ban, if you limit contributions, you ban corporate union donations, then, Honourable Speaker, all of that mistrust is gone. It's alleviated. It's easier to administer, Honourable Speaker. Why are we doing this? Honourable Speaker, our democracy is broken and this government is missing out an opportunity to fix it. It's much like wage and price controls. Realistically, they're pretty hard to implement. Try, trying, to control, trying to control somebody's income, pretty hard thing to do. So you attack it from the other end if you think it's producing unfairness and inequality in society. You tax it. In politics, if you want to prevent the image of big money talking, then ban corporate union donations for starters. Then talk about full disclosure in a timely way that allows people to know who's financing whose campaign prior to election date, not after. If you're, going to, if you're really going to make it, make it work, then those things need to be in place. And if they're not in place, then it seems to me we're not really moving forward. We are doing steps that simply aren't going to be effective. It's, it's rather like a leaking roof, Honourable Speaker. At some point, you can continue to patch each little leak as it happens instead of accepting the fact that you need a whole new roof which is probably the best thing to do. And the reality is what we're really doing here is a patchwork job.
is, it is progress. But the reality is that what is really required is something that will clearly demonstrate that government and politicians and people who participate in the electoral process are serious about full disclosure. In a modern world of everything being sent in the ether, uh, where communication is instant, where Facebook is available, where things get input and are readily available to be sent someplace else and reviewed and recorded, the government could have taken a bold step here and instead of setting out the reporting requirements that the bill does and the, and the spending limits and those kinds of things, why not an online system? And it may arguably be more red tape, and I'll say something about that in a minute, but why not an online system where campaign contributions are disclosed immediately upon receipt? So if the member for Skeena makes a donation to a municipal campaign to, to one of the mayoral candidates, by the end of the day, you can go on a, that candidate's website and see exactly what has been donated that day. The Minister of Advanced Education says I have great faith in computer systems. Well, I, I, and technology, I do want to say in fairness that I wasn't suggesting we employ the companies the BC Liberals have to date. I was hoping for somewhat greater expertise, but I use that as a simple example. Because what's really of concern is where the money comes from, and finding out about where the money came from sometime after the election really isn't of much use, because if it has been successfully applied, arguably, then all you've really got the opportunity to do is to observe very carefully whether or not that particular elected official is more, res more or less responsive to some of his or her heavier donors. I think what people really want to know is who are paying for campaigns and where the money's coming from. I've, I have listened to all the comments from members opposite. And I've listened to the issues that have been raised, which are not substantive to the bill as it stands in this house, but issues that I know they have been speaking about for quite a period of time. But I'm always reminded, Mr. Speaker, when we talk about electors not being able to make up their own minds or the inference that donations will actually influence the voters, when I know clearly the people that I knocked on virtually every door in my community when I was running for local election were very engaged and were delighted that candidates would come to their door and talk to them. They never once asked about donations to the campaign or how my campaign was being financed. What they did ask about was what were the policy areas that I felt were important and what was the vision for the community that I was seeking elected office for. And I absolutely believe that voters, when they walk into an election polling station, walk in with a very clear picture of who they're going to vote for. And I believe that the voters uh, are smart enough to know that they vote for people that they believe in. A lot of people spend a lot of time over quite a few years talking about this issue, debating it back and forth, having vigorous debates about donation limits and expense limits and all of those things. And I think that was healthy. That was a healthy part of the democracy we live in. And so I'm confident that after all the work that was done, all the counsel we received, that the changes that are reflected in the bill that is before the House are ones that honour the people who did participate. And it wasn't just elected officials, it was a cross-section of people from the community who also made donations or make donations. And so we heard it from a broad cross-section over those years to the place where I think we have something that is before this House. And I'm delighted to hear from the members opposite that they think it is a step in the right direction. And I believe that any uh, step that will ensure
more transparency, more accountability is something that is good for our democratic process. And with that, I move second reading. Honorable members, uh, you have all heard the question. Uh, all those in favor? Aye. Opposed? Motion carried. former Chief Electoral Officer for BC. He participated on the panel advocating for voting over the internet. We must realize, we must be clear that voting on the internet is about making easy for citizens to give away their political power to a few political representatives on Elections Day. Here is Harry Neufeld. Um. Uh, my, I really do believe that internet voting is the future, but I also think that it needs to be um, moved towards carefully, deliberately, and with uh, healthy public debate in the process. I think internet voting is the future because it's what Canadians expect. Uh, they expect flexibility, uh, they expect that all services that are offered by the private sector, by the public sector, evolve with their changing expectations. And Canadians um, conduct a lot of business daily electronically. The process ultimately needs to be understandable, it needs to be transparent, it needs to be equitable and accessible. I put up a quote uh, from, uh, I'm told, a famous British politician about the nature of progress and uh, how you first you get ignored and then you're told you're mad and then dangerous and then after a pause nobody disagrees anymore. I'm, I'm happy to say that I've been talking about uh, internet voting in one way or another for quite a long time and uh, I'm at the point where they're calling me dangerous uh, but that's progress. Thank you so much. Voting on the internet is an inevitable technological development being adopted all over the world. Carefully managing it, not like a business from a for-profit provider, but rather like a democratic public service, is more important than high tech itself. In other words, not just the economic advantage or the efficiency of technology, but most important of all is who is operating it. If you can change your vote when you change your mind, that, that is what democracy is all about. Now, polling.ca. Perpetual democracy doesn't mean that you have to vote every day. It just means that you have the right and the ability to vote anytime you want. And that is what perpetual democracy is all about. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.